I think that's where like my knowledge set is really going to be pushed. So I, I, think, I do know a little bit about environments only because I played with them during the advent of code because I couldn't think of any other way to have a state. Pull. I remember that he said that environments have, you know, are mutable and they don't do that copy on uh, modified thing. I'm like, ah, I'll use environment somehow. So I quickly learned enough to be able to, <laughs> to, to use them for that advent of code thing I wanted to do. Yeah, so that's probably going to be like probably use and abuse of vi- environments. What I was doing, but <laughs> it's, it's going to like that's it's with this book. It's just like there's just a point where you reach it. Like it's just so it's beyond what I do probably in my day to day. Like I need to start, you know, I need to learn it because that's like where I'm at in my journey of learning it. But it's like now it's like now it's like you're pushing yourself to learn even more. And so environments yeah. is going to be where that's where it's going to start like pushing me. Um, well, but, I mean, I think we've said this before, or maybe a different book. I always say this, that it's good to like stretch yourself. Like we're doing this probability for data science book club too. Um, and it's like some of the things are like, Oh, sets and, you know, measure zeros and all this, you know, stuff like, I know I'm not going to ever need this probably again, but just stretch a little bit further than you do need. Then, you know, it's like lifting up the heavy weight. And then you, when you when you have to lift up the regular weight, it's a little bit easier. It's like, well, at yeah. least it's not measure zero sets. So this should be pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, that's the hard, that's the hard part is like keeping, hey, it's, it's the hard part of like keeping yourself motivated to be like, okay, I know I may not need this like right away, but then like you, like there's little tidbits of like when you're working, you're like, yeah. oh, I remember this little concept and why it's important and stuff. So it's definitely, yeah, when we get to environments, I think that's going to be where my like my ledge of knowledge is going to be like, where I'm going to have to really push myself. Yeah. I guess we're talking about like stuff you're learning in this chapter, because I, I think I understand what you're saying. And I think I totally agree, because there's like times <laughs> I'm like, when am I ever going to put a bunch of functions in a list? You know <laughs> what I mean? But I'm sure there is like a place for that, you know? Yeah. I came across, I I went down the rabbit hole of like lexical and dynamic scope. And Mm -hmm. I came across some, some blog posts that I'll reference tonight that it was was way beyond, like it is way beyond like my like understanding. And, but I I did learn a couple of things from it. So yeah, dynamic, dynamic scope is just a nightmare. I mean, I guess there's some, some places we might prefer, but generally it's not the kind of thing you want. The early Lisp, uh, early Lisp versions did that. They used dynamic scope, and yeah, they got away from that. I think finally with common Lisp and Scheme and other things, and R, which is just a kind of Lisp. It turns out I'm finding out. <laughs> so yeah. when you say so, so when you say Lisp, is that like a, a specific programming language, or is that like a way of programming? No, it's a it's a Ancient. programming language. It's one of the early, earliest. It's like Fortran and then Lisp. I think came out around the same time. <laughs> yeah. And Lisp yeah. evolved over time. To it's very in many ways it has some of the same kind of flavors that R does. I know R is in some parts influenced by Lisp because he, internally it even has S expressions, which is a Lisp thing. R is based on S. I mean that's that's all. That's yeah. all that R is. So I suspect that, um, and it's interesting because like much like R, Lisp also has like ton of object systems and everything else that were glued on over time so it's kind of interesting parallels there and it's functional language and yeah everything's an expression and you can do a lot of meta programming like you can in r yeah hmm, that's really cool yeah. yeah when i come across some of that stuff i have to remind myself like the computer science stuff is like it's just beyond like what i know and so it's like you come across some of the language and you're like is this a programming language? Is this a type of programming? <laughs> is this a specific concept in like, so? Yeah. If I could speak to that, actually, what's interesting is like, I mean, I, it sounds like both Colin and I are like non-comp science people, but Ron, you have like a proper, you know, background. Um, Cause it's funny when you read a lot of our stuff, it's like, unlike other more traditional languages, <laughs> art you know, doesn't do X, Y, or Z. I'm kind of like, I didn't even know any of these things were an issue. So yeah, sometimes it's like, we're not always as newbies. We're not always, um, what's the word? Like we don't realize how remarkable some of these practices are and are because we don't really have anything to compare it to. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then all the stuff about the weirdnesses of our, oh, ours ours is this weird language. Well, it's like, I don't know, you know, it's better than SPSS, baby. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, what I'm trying to do anyway, but. 
Yeah. Well, there's just a lot of conveniences that are built in, but like those conveniences are built on the foundations of some of these concepts. And so it's like, yeah. you know, it's it's easy to take take for granted some of these conveniences that have been built up, but that's not always been the case. So you always have to kind of like know the foundations to learn even more. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's yeah, it's um th this book actually. I'm kind of glad I'm doing this because I, I tried to start reading this book by myself a couple times, and it's just like you just get it, and it's like, man, you, it's like almost like a therapy group. This because you know it's like um you're just like what ah you know like I don't get it you know it's like it's so complex but anyway but yeah no it's um yeah the the funny thing about like not what you said before about oh you know it uh depends on you know I'll, I'll pay attention now but I probably won't need this until later like that that feeling comes up like just all the time <laughs> you know um but for when I as I read this I should say but Anyway. Well, I mean, you know, before we get started, I mean, like just a case in point, like, you know, I have a, I have another person on my team who mainly writes in R2 and, and he ran into a problem that he just couldn't figure out. And it was a problem with like vectors and like the type of vector it was, and he just couldn't figure it out. And like, I saw it and I was like, hmm, that sounds like a problem with a character vector there. Like you technically don't have an NA value. And that was partly because like, I just came across it when we talked about vectors and stuff. And so you know, it, it does help in little ways. Um, most certainly. Mm -hmm. I think it probably also is going to help when you like, if you read other people's code, because I see a lot of these things, like, especially when we get into like infix, like the infix forms of mm -hmm. like function writing, like I come across that so much. And I remember the first time I came across some of the stuff and I was like, what is this? But now right. it makes a lot more sense of what it does. So, yeah. Well, anyways, I think for I, sure. I mean, I got to agree oh, go with you that uh, for me too, like the, the him fix stuff, I'm like, I actually didn't even know how, what that was. I kept, yeah. you know, why is there always these percent symbols around the old pipe symbol or another place yeah. like in, why is there percents around in? Now I know <laughs> it's like, Oh, it has to be that way. I got you. Other languages like Haskell, for example, you can define things to be infix. Like it's almost like an attribute. I wonder why they didn't choose that. Like to be an attribute of the function to be infix. Then it would just, you can use anything. But, hmm. Yeah. It's just a weird quirk. Yeah. It's a weird R quirk. It's all right. <laughs> uh, I don't think Robert's going to join us today. I think he was no, sick. sick. So I said he was under the weather. So uh, let me share my screen here. I think what we'll do is uh, desktop three share. Wow. What a mess that is. Oops. So, um, so everybody see mm -hmm. the sheet that I'm sharing? Okay, sweet. So I just wanted to quickly highlight for everybody um, kind of where we're at in the schedule. Obviously, yep. next week we're going to skip for the holiday because I'm sure many of you don't want to <laughs> meet the day after um, day after Christmas if you are celebrating. Um, so we'll skip for that and then we'll go into environments and then we'll be pretty good up until about the daylight savings time in March. So we'll get a pretty big chunk of getting through a bunch of this. So. Uh, tonight, I was going to take on talking about functions. Uh, I'm going to say that this was a pretty comprehensive chapter, and I was able to go back and review some of the old cohorts uh, materials. And if you look at like cohort six, like cohort, like bro cohort six broke it up into three sessions. So I'm going to try and get it into one, <laughs> if at all possible. <laughs> so I was going to um, say this, dude, I was, I mean, and it's not any reflection on you, but yeah, this is, this is like, the such a seminal issue if we have to go into multiple sessions that's fine yeah oh absolutely and i will take like i will take like some liberties and say like there's some stuff that i may not cover because there's some rules and stuff that i was like okay that's good to know but maybe it's not as important but in this conversation if there is something that we need to discuss further like let's discuss it. I, I'm not afraid of like pushing stuff forward if we have to or to dig deeper into something too. So um, or if I get something wrong, because I probably we will get something wrong in our conversation. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I said, cohort six broke it up into three sessions. So um, if we have to break it up into multiple, that's cool, too. So from looking through the chapter and going through it, I think these are like the learning objectives that we should get out of it. Really, we should be able to discuss the components of a function. Um, we should also be able to observe or we're going to observe different ways to compose a function. And then uh, we're going to discuss the rules of lexical scoping. 
Uh, so how R goes about finding variables or finding the values associated with specific names. Uh, highlight some of the properties of lazy evaluation and some of the benefits that it affords us. Uh, overview some of the tools to exit out of a function. And then the last one, be able to talk about the three different forms of how to compose a function. And so uh, to start our conversation, uh, so some of this material, there's going to be some examples from like, I can't remember which cohort had these examples. So some of these are not my examples, but I kept them in there just in case. So some of them I may skip because I don't necessarily understand them from the perspective of the other cohort, but uh, there was a couple of in here that I definitely wanted to keep. So let's just talk about how we make a simple function. So this is the kind of the, the diagram that the book is going to follow um, when it creates like a function diagram. This is going to become even more important as we get further on the book because the book mentions like this is some of the foundational material you're going to have to know for like later concepts. And even later on in the chapter, there's some discussion about like, hey, here's here's how this thing works, but we're going to talk about it in chapter nine or we're going to talk about it in chapter 16. So some stuff we'll just like briefly talk about, but we may come across it again in another chapter. So when you look at this, the diagram, basically the black dot is the environment to which the function is, is represented in. And then the two blocks are the arguments of the function. So we'll talk about function arguments. Can I just, now, can I just say like I I I I I never understood the nature of this this figure like so like <laughs> so like what is that, that that structure supposed to so like okay so like the black dot is like the overarching structure and then the x and the y are just like within it I mean yeah anyway it's it's kind of weird anyway well he says the dot is the environment I don't I don't okay. know why he has that as a little dot connected to it like that but. I guess maybe maybe this type of little, like, it looks, like a, looks like a little bullet or something like that. So maybe this type of this type of figure is common in like developer language. I, I'm just not used to it. Sorry, I've never seen it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I've seen something similar to this. Like, I have, I'm sure, yeah, I've seen something similar to this well, when I was. Thicker. I've seen something like it in SQL. Like mm -hmm. there's like, I, I don't know if it's the exact same graph, but it's like, it's like an execution graph where it will like show like how like the SQL statement will execute. Like it's very like beyond what I know. Mm -hmm. But I think what's really important about this is just knowing that like contained in here are like the arguments. So if we look at this function here, it's an argument X, Y, right? It's gonna mm -hmm. have two arguments, argument X, argument Y and it's contained in its own specific environment. And then this little, this little like digit here, these digits and, and characters just basically represents the memory address to where the function is stored. And so I think that's probably gonna come up, gonna be important, especially when we probably get to like yeah. function factories or something. So I just looked at uh, structure interpretation computer program and these kind of diagrams are used in that book, not this particular one, but the, the ones he used before with the dots and the arrows, box and pointer, I guess he calls them, um, those are very common in that book. So I think the dot here is meant to be a dot that points off somewhere, but we're not going to show what it is, right? So should, you can imagine there's an arrow from that dot, that circle that goes off to the actual environment, but he's not showing it. Yeah, and I think the and I think the other thing to think about this too is is like in my mindset, like I when I when somebody says a function. I get the idea of this. This is like what comes to my mind first, but that's not always the case in R because there's different function forms. And so I think we need to introduce a new different diagram in this case because it's not always going to take this, this form. And so we have to have a more general form that will apply across. And if I might add something to that, the thing you pointed to at the bottom of the screen is a syntactic thing right that's how you can, one way of defining a function once you've executed that you create an actual object that is a function and that's what the thing at the top is meant to represent the actual function itself rather than the the syntax that creates it one particular way of creating it actually right yeah exactly i, I yeah, and it has the three parts right to are in there so which is a good segue <laughs> a function a function <laughs> has basically three parts uh, there in, in the book, it talks about formals, body, and environment. Formals are the argument of the function. Body is the body of the function. So the actual computation that you're doing and your return statement, and then the environment to which like what the container, when I, anytime I hear environment, I think container, I don't know if that's the right way to think about it, but that's just how I imagine it. 
Um, pre pretty much every function has a container that it works in. And so um, here's an example from the previous cohort. Uh, they had this data set called coffee rankings or ratings. They did this like simple analysis here where they just did some slicing and selecting of different columns and variables. And then what they decided to do was just convert it into a function so that they could iterate and add different species of coffee. And so here's their function definition. I think we're all pretty much, much familiar with this. We define our arguments inside of the function function. And then um, here's the body of the function where the computation is actually happening. And then here we're explicitly returning it. And so since we have this function, it's more general. So we can pass arguments into it. And in our case here, Arabica or, uh, yeah, right, Arabica, right? Mm -hmm. I'm saying that correct. Um, you're getting the average points for Arabica coffee, right? It's um, pretty sure for, we're all pretty, pretty familiar with these. So I don't think I need to dig too much into it. Um, but what's important about this is that this has different um, different components. And we can look at these different components through different functions that are available to us. So if we wanted to look at all the arguments of a function, we could use this formals function. So which this function only has one argument, which is species. Uh, we could print out the body of the function using body. And obviously it returns what we have returned. Uh, what's important about this body function is it's not going to return comments. So if there's comments it's defined inside of the function, it's not going to return it with this function. We'll have to use a different one. And then we can use this environment function. Obviously, because we define this at the top level, um, it's going to be in it's going to be in the R global environment. And so um, the other thing is, is functions use attributes just like other objects, um, because functions are an object in R. And so they can have attributes attached onto them. And one common attribute that functions have is this source reference or SRC REF. And we can actually see what this source reference is, which is the function uh, function definition itself. And so you can run the attributes function here on our function and then pull out the attribute source ref, and then it will print out everything. And you'll notice because comments are part of the source ref, it will return all of it. And so I was kind of thinking about like what you could possibly use this for. I mean, maybe if you were debugging or you were trying to see the definition rather than digging into like the function function itself into the source file, you could just print it out and look at it this way is what I thought about it. But I think big picture is a big picture. It's every function is an object and objects can have attributes and one attribute that functions have is the source ref. So um, I was just going to say, can I just say real quick, like how many, I, I haven't really looked at a lot of like uh, uh, function uh, source code, but like how many of them really have code comments? That was my thinking. Like, I, I mean, we don't need to call Scarif or, or whatever, that's our cref. Um, I mean, so uh, like if we just said the body, I mean, like how much more information are we getting from bot, you know, from the the attribute uh, from calling the attribute versus um, calling the body. I don't know. That's, that's, that's not a particularly profound insight, but it just seemed like that was something that came up to me. Does the does the print method just give out the 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 uh, source ref though? Is that what it does? That is a great question, and I am not sure. And I would like to check that. We can check no. that here. So. Uh, let me go up here. Functions, functions, functions. So we have average points, right? So make sure average points are defined. So we have average points here. So what do we want to just do print? Average Or just points. type it. Just type average points. So call the print method, right? Want it? No, it doesn't. So average points. No, looks like it probably is calling source ref because there is no, there is no code comments okay, associated with it. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean with code no, it's comments, it's actually doing the body, not doing the source ref. You mean, yeah? Oh, yeah, it's only doing the body of the function. So if you well, want to I... look at the source of a function, like if you're trying to figure out how something works in R, I guess it makes sense to, to know about that source ref thing if you want to see the comments. I mean, that's why you never see any comments because you, did, you didn't know they were there. <laughs> Actually, that's a good point because sometimes sometimes I'll, I'll print out like a function to see yeah, how it's I working. Yeah. yeah. And it won't contain the comments. That's I interesting. Didn't know that. 
That's really interesting. I never thought about that, that if you're calling that, you have to look at the attributes to see the actual whole comments. So that's interesting. But to get back at your question, I mean, I guess it just depends on like what code you're looking at. Like, I mean, there's there's code that I have that I've written that has a ton of comments in it. Same. But other people, <laughs> very, very little of comments. So um, I guess it's it's probably specific to the people who are writing it. So. Um, so the next kind of discussion is these ideas about primitives. So there is an exception to a rule to this idea of three basic components. Um, and the exception to this rule are primitive functions. Uh, primitive functions, the reason why they don't have any uh, formals, bodies, or environments is because they are written in C. And um, when you think about this, there's a lot of core base R functions that are strictly written in C. So a base function that is out there is sum. So if you try and print this out in your console, what you'll get is you'll get something like this, function dot primitive sum. And what I'm guessing is happening here is, is that this dot primitive sum is probably calling the C code definition in the R source code, which is what I would understand it to do. But I'm not 100% sure if that's the case of what's happening here. Um, Cause I don't know C and I don't really know, understand how in the background it works. There's different types of primitives. So there's built-in primitives, there's special primitives. And so you can, you can use the type of function to see what type of primitive it is. Uh, sum is built in. Uh, if you want to look at what the bracket is, bracket we use for subsetting is special. And I thought it would go a little bit further and see what the arrow function is because the arrow technically is a function. Um, it is a special primitive. And so I thought that was kind of interesting to see as well. Why is this important? Well, this is the exception to the rule. So if you try and look at the formals, the body, the environment of this base R function, you will get null returned. And the reason that is, is because it's not defined in R code, it's defined in C. So I remember the first time I did one, the first time when I was like getting into this idea of looking at like function source codes, I would run across this and see this and be like, this doesn't make any sense. Somebody told me that these functions were supposed to be defined in R code, but they're actually defined in C code. So um, this is just good to see that this is something that pops up. Uh, what questions do people have about this or any further discussion about primitive functions? I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly helped to read about that because I had a similar thing where I would see stuff like about primitives or about blah, blah, you know closures or whatever, and which I know we're going to come up on that soon. But yeah, it's like knowing more about these things that usually only come up when something is wrong <laughs> is um, something we probably all should be learning more about. For sure. So, um, so let's talk about some kind of standard functions, uh, or let's talk about basically the functions that we're pretty used to. Um, our functions are known as first class functions. And so uh, I try to put a uh, somewhat of an understanding or definition around this. And so the way I understand what it means by first class functions is um, our functions are basically objects in their own right, right? So everything in R is an object. And so I'm going back to the John Chambers uh, quote, which is going to be quoted on later here. Mm -hmm. But because it's an object, it's a first class type of object. And the way I understand this is, is that it's first class because there is no special syntax to define or name a function. So all you really have to do is use the function function, and then you have to use the, the name binding arrow to define your function. So I just, here's just the basic example. Here I have a function to which I am defining here, which is just x1 return x. All it does is return one, um, but all we have to do to define this is basically give it, oh, we don't always have to give it a name. I'm going to take that back, but um, we can use the function here, and then we can use the special arrow here, um, which we don't always need to use the arrow, but that's the way I understood the idea, the concept of first class is just basically like there's no special syntax that you really have to use outside of using the function function and the assignment arrow if you're going to give it a name but i don't know if, if we want to expand on that or not but that's the way i understood it when it said first class yeah that's what i thought too 
So uh, we're going to get to the idea of anonymous functions. So I agree with your assessment there. (laughs) I mean, like I've heard that before, but like I just never really understood what first class mean, but I'm just going to understand it as like there's there's nothing special about it. Right. We don't have to do anything special. Like isn't isn't there like other programming languages where like you have to define like basically everything before you can even define a function? Like you have to define your base types and I something. Like I don't know that. about that, but certainly in many programming languages, functions aren't first class, so you can't return a function, you can't pass a function to a uh, to a function, you can't just store it in a variable and and then you know pass it around like a like first class citizen like every other thing else in the, in a language right so most like C you can't do that you can, you can do function pointers but they're kind of weird they're not first class by any means so you can pass them um, function pointers around but it's not really the same thing there's no environment with them and they're not closures hmm. so uh, yeah so that's that's kind of the big difference between functional programming languages like R certainly seems to be and other languages. Huh, uh, an- another example is Java, for example, you can't treat methods as first class objects. In fact, you sort of can, but you have to wrap them in another thing, right? Call it a function. They have to have an object that we're we have a call method or something, right? Mm. So oh, that's fun- neat. A function object, but it's actually a spe- and same thing as C too, although they keep introducing more and more s- fixes onto it. So I don't know what the newest version, maybe they elevated functions to more like a first-class citizen, but they're not like in R or Scheme or Haskell where they're just literally just regular every, you know, they're first-class citizens. <laughs> you can do anything you want with them. <laughs> That's interesting because like when I try and like, when I try and learn like other programming languages like JavaScript or something like that, and I don't know if this is the case because I'm sure there's functions in JavaScript, but like that idea of like, trying to transfer some of these knowledges of a functional programming language into my knowledge set of learning another programming language. And so there's some of that struggle sometimes because it's like, why does not everything work like R? Because R was my first programming language. And so I need to understand that. Java that, does. Does JavaScript, JavaScript do? I think JavaScript does. Because JavaScript, like a lot of like scripty languages do this. Yeah. If you know what I mean by scripty, you know, <laughs> Python. <laughs> yeah. And when I said learning JavaScript, it was like a weekend where I tried to read a couple chapters. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but let's talk about when we don't give a name to a function. Um, this is where we run across anonymous functions. Um, so this is where we don't assign a name to our function. And there are certain situations where we don't necessarily need to do the work of giving a function a name. And in that case, it's going to be known as anonymous. Now, um, some of these examples, again, came from uh, the previous cohort. So you can look at it here with L apply, which I understand is just basically list apply. So basically, it's going to take this data set here for miles. So if you're not familiar, empty cars is a data set. We're just going to select two columns from that data set, MPG and cylinder. And we're basically going to pass it to this function. And all this function is doing is it's giving us the uh, the length of the unique values in that um, column. And so this function technically has no name because we're using it inside of this L apply. Um, What's nice about this as of 4.1.0, so R4.1.0, there is now a new syntax for anonymous functions. Um, You can now use this um, backslash X without having to use function and it still works the same. So if you want to look at the news for where this is related, it's in 4.1.0, but it has this new shorthand notation for creating functions that uses this slash X and it still works. So I haven't used that um, to define all functions. Is there any actual difference between that and the the function longer form? Like every time I define (sighs) a function, I just use slash and then arguments and then write, write, start writing a function. I don't know. I mean, like the first time I saw this was when we had like our first question, like when we were talking a way back when we started this book club and John reached out to Hadley and then Hadley shared this, like this syntax. So I really haven't played around with it a lot yet. Um, I just basically know it basically works the same as any function. So it's just shorthand, I think, basically. I think, did some people call it Lambda? Lambda That's what I call it because that's, I mean, that it's very similar to, it's, um, there's something called Lambda Calculus, which is kind of like the foundational mathematics of functional programming languages. And the, the symbol that's used there is Lambda, the Greek symbol, Lambda. And then 
other languages that are based on that, like Haskell, actually uses backslash or the slash as a shorthand or as a way of representing lambda. So that's that's kind of how I, that's why I like it a lot. It's like, oh, cool, lambdas, yay. <laughs> Yeah, so it's just shorthand um, that got introduced into 4.1.0. Sorry, go ahead, Ron. I was just going to say one of the cool things about learning this, uh, learning R for people that don't know other programming languages, it's actually kind of a cool language to learn first because you learn all these interesting kind of advanced features that aren't in many programming languages or just now being introduced, like lambdas were introduced into C++, I think, recently and right anonymous functions. So it's like, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, you get to see what's possible, but then when you go to other programming languages and you can't find it, you're just like, uh, <laughs> that's true. Or, or you find a way to shoot yourself in the foot really easily. So, yeah. a part of me wants to wonder if R is kind of like the wild west of programming languages. It is in some ways. Yeah. It is. I think. I think that's exactly right. I mean, but well, I does, guess most people don't learn R as a programming language, right? They learn it to do statistics. And that's why this advanced R book was such a great choice for me because I want to learn it as a programming language. And that's what Hadley says this book is for. So, but it's to me, it's like such a strange thing. It's like, wait a minute, you didn't learn it as a programming language? You just learned it as a like a calculator, I guess, in some ways. Like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's pretty much what the learning path for me was. It's just like, oh, you can do these really interesting like transformations and do it really quickly. And then it just turned into like, okay, I want to do more. And then you just like, then you got to start learning these computer science concepts and then builds on it. So it, 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 I guess it would be a lot more interesting if you came from the perspective of like a different programming language. So that's what this book was, is to help translate some of those concepts from other yeah. programming languages yeah. in R. So. It's helping me a lot. That's for sure. Um. So this is kind of the same thing, but with map, um, I'm a map user. I'm a per map person. Um, so just to make a little bit more sense, I use this example here. But it still works, right? Here's an anonymous function. We're passing empty cars, just printing the max value in a list format of all the columns. So um, same thing here, but it still works the same, right? You can pass this in here, create your own function, define it here as normal, and then just pass it into L apply if you want to as well. It works the same. To make it even more clear, I decided to, oh, so there's another thing that the book talked about was this concept of functions in a list. Um, I've never used this before, but I thought it was kind of interesting. So I was like, I'm going to create kind of a, an example that I can like wrap my mind around. So what I did is I decided to take some ggplot2 code here. And all I'm really doing is I'm just switching up, like, all I'm really doing here is I'm just switching up the, the type of, um, the type of geom that I'm using for the plot. I don't know if you would use this in real life, but I just, to make it a little bit easier for me. So here's just two different functions. One plots a column plot of these two variables. And then the other one does like a scatter plot for these other two variables. And you can use this functions list point, and then it will pull this, which whatever function you want to use. And so here's, here's a scatter plot of weight to miles per gallon. And then here's the bar chart of cylinders for four miles per gallon. And so I didn't do any like advanced formatting of these plots, but it's just interesting to see how this works. I don't know if anybody else here has ever done something like this, but I would be interested to hear if I do have an example, but I want to open it up to the group of where they might have used this before. I have used it quite a bit doing Haskell programming, but I haven't done that for a number of years, so I can't remember exactly why it was so handy, but it certainly was handy at the time. I just don't remember why. How about you, Ryan? Have you ever? I think you mentioned at the start that this is something that you had a question about where you. Oh, well, the anonymous this. function thing. I, I mean, I I would say I've I've done. I mean, I've used other people's examples in like things like ggplot where you wanted to do some funky thing, but yeah, it's funny. Like he he mentioned something like, um, oh, you know, you can use anonymous functions when the the, the function you're using isn't interesting enough to be named. I was like, I don't know about y'all, but like. I mean, I'm, if I'm making a function, it's interesting, man. I don't know. I usually, but then I can see the logic of this, though. So, but. Well, I use I use anonymous functions all the time in R, for sure, because I'm just used to that style. So if I'm, you know, having to do a map, for example, and and I forget, I or I'm using apply, for example, because I don't have tidyverse in, um, and I want to do something to, you know, that's more complicated, but I'm never going to need up, you know, it's going to like add and couple of things and divided by three. I don't need a new function for that. So I use that anonymous function syntax for sure in that case. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of the 
the canonical example, right? Whoa, you're using a map, but there's other places we have to pass in a function where you might want to do it too. Any of these R statistics things, a lot of them do take functions for doing things. And if you don't need to define a special function, you have to save, make a name up for it and never use it again. It's actually clear, I think, just to throw it in there as an anonymous function, in my yeah. opinion. No, that's a that's a good point because you got to think about it. Like anytime that you give a reference to a name, you're cluttering yeah. up your environment, right? So like anytime that you can reduce the amount of objects in your environment, you know, the the clearer your environment will be, which I'm sure will come up again when we talk about environments. So um, I did think of an example of where this does come up, but I don't know if anybody's had the chance to read the R for Data Science book. Um, but this kind of goes with map. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with like PMAP or invoke map, um, but basically this kind of follows that same concept where you're creating these data objects that contain, um, can either contain like different function calls or they can contain different like variables. And then PMAP iterates over those functions or that list of objects. And so I highly suggest reading at least this section of it starting okay. at 21.7. And it will kind of talk about this concept of a plan. Like here it is, like here, here's the example in this invoke map, what it's doing is it's running these different functions, run if our norm, our, uh, I think it's our, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher the name. White boss. Boss, <laughs> yeah. Passan. It's probably Passan. Probably Passan, right? Is Passan, what I guess. Yes. Yep. So basically, it's doing that. It's taking these three different functions in a list object here. So run or a, in a vector, run if r norm r r Passan, and then runs those functions. So I have seen this before, but it when I try and do this, like this is the most complex iteration that. I've seen run before, but that's pretty interesting though. Although here, there he's actually just using strings. He's not a list of the actual functions, right? Yeah, but the functions still run though, yeah. don't they? Yeah. I mean, because because what it's the way doing, invoke map works. Yeah, that's the way. And I've never used invoke map, but I use pmap all the time. So like pmap, if you have it's a yeah. But yeah, so I this is like the one that came to my mind um that kind of relates to what we were talking about. But I would check this. Check out the R for DS, at least the iteration chapter yeah. is really good. Really, really good. I need to get finished going through that book. I haven't done that. <laughs> it's really good. Um, okay, so let's talk about invoking a function. Um, there's multiple ways to invoke a function. Oh, um, there most... you might. I'm sorry. Oh, to interrupt, but I just no, had one more thing about anonymous functions where they could come in handy. A little trick you can do called immediately invoked anonymous function, I guess you might call it here. Immediately invoked Lambda. So it has to do with this idea of not clutter, cluttering up the namespace. If you need to define a couple of variables temporarily, right? You can write, write a little anonymous function, define the variables in the function, and then use them, and then immediately invoke it so it'll actually get executed with those names. Then those names will disappear at the end. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. It's a neat little trick. It's meant to, to do the... Um, a lot of languages have the built-in syntactic sugar for this. They call it a let statement. You know, you let this in this. You know, Let f equal this in this. Um, is a way of having temporary names you only need for, for a second, which would be cleaner than using an anonymous function in some places. So you might want to have a name just for now, so for documentation purposes, then you don't want it anymore. Huh, that kind of goes at that concept when we get to like lexical scoping, the idea yeah. of a fresh start, right? Yeah. So I that's a, I... the trick there is to use the function as a, a little closure to temporarily, you know, have some variables be named. That makes a lot of sense because I never really thought about that keeping your namespace clean, right? So like if you had a complex, if you had like a complex system that was that you're putting together and you had a lot of like names floating around in your namespace that you don't need, but you only need it at a specific time, it's probably good to put it inside of a closure or in our case it's function a, here. It's a the only reason I know about that because it's a common trick in JavaScript, actually. <laughs> huh. That's neat. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, I'm that's trying to find cool. a reference to it I could post so that I could you could learn more about it if you wanted to. But I didn't know. Yeah, that's well. I think that's kind of neat because I didn't think about because when I was reading some of the lexical scoping rules, I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but like it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me, but now it does. Like you, if you want to keep your namespace clean, you're gonna you want go. that behavior. I so. found it. And of course, Wikipedia. Where else? <laughs> Immediately invoked function expression is called in because in JavaScript those called function expressions. But yeah. Hmm. I, for your future reading. <laughs> I'll have to take a look at it. 
Um, it's a good thing to put in your code to people be impressed by like, whoa, what is this trickery? What is this witchcraft you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, so which brings us to a good point about invoking functions. There's multiple ways to invoke a function in R, right? Most of us are pretty familiar um, with this common form where um, we just take the function name, wrap it in parentheses, and then pass in our arguments, right? And so what I'm doing here is I'm just creating a uniform distribution, uh, creating a vector that represents a uniform distribution with the value with one to 10 different um, objects, and then they can range anywhere from zero to 100. Um, but what we could do is we could invoke it another way by starting with a data structure of the arguments and then passing it to this function called do.call. And so I've never seen this before. I've never seen this used, um, but you could do this where you take your arguments or you take this list that has all of the argument definitions for the function, pass it into do.call and you won't get the same value back here, but um, it does the same same behavior as it would if you were using either form. So, that, yeah, actually, that, that seems like a cool little thing. I mean, I, I was trying to think of like a use case for that, like where like you know you want to just like line up all of the arguments like a slug and, a, and an object just to like to plug it in, you know, easily. I mean, I mean, it's an interesting idea. I'm not sure if it's how much of a time saver it is or or like how efficient it is, but it's interesting. I mean, I am way outside of my depth here with this comment, but I'm going to say it like, what if you, what if you needed to like create a bunch of different data sets for, I don't know, simulations or something. Mm -hmm. And what you could do is, is you could take this do call, wrap a map around it and let it mm -hmm. create a bunch of, you know, a bunch of uh, values for you. Or you could even try and like create lists within lists and see if it would create different distributions or whatever based on your parameters, yeah. something like that. Yeah. But that's way outside of my town. <laughs> don't, no, 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 no argument there. I mean, I don't, yeah, I'm, yeah. Um, but that's just one use case that I thought of. Um, yeah. Mm. Really interesting. A part of me also wants to think about that you might be able to use this in shiny in a, in a shiny context somewhere, like if you had different behavior based on different values of what was contained in the list, but that might be a stretch too. Um, so let's talk about function composition. So many of these we're probably familiar with, but the book wants to cover them again and and not only talks about the different types of composition, but talks about the benefits and the disadvantages of each. So I'm going to briefly cover these because we're probably all familiar with them. Um, but the first kind of way to compose our functions is to nest them. And so nesting is good for if you have like very simple code, right? Um, this, I would probably say is still okay. But if you started using more functions, more functions and nesting it, and you have this one long like string of functions and it's a one liner it's going to be harder for other people to read. And so it's only really good for simple code and it becomes very, very hard as you nest additional code inside of it. And so um, when you look at this, basically we're defining two functions here, square and deviation. And then we're just creating a uniform distribution here into the, giving it the name of this object X. And then we're performing all of these um, calculations on this to return a value. Um, so that's one way to do it. There's also, we can do the same thing, but we can use intermediate variables for that. Um, it's great because, well, you can do this because it makes a little, it's a little bit clearer of the steps that you're doing. But the problem is, is that you have to do a lot of extra work because you have to name each one of these steps. And this example here is using the same name out, but if you were trying to save these values, you would have to give it a different name each time you did this. And so it could clutter up your environment with different objects that you may only be using once. And is it worth really saving these? And then piping, uh, it's easier to read and it's only applicable when we have like a linear sequence of transformations. And so most of us are pretty probably familiar with the Magritter pipe, um, but as of R4.1.0, now base R has its own pipe. And so in my own 
uh, in my own work, I've been trying to incorporate the base pipe more than I have in the McGregor pipe, but you can write it uh, like this. And here's the news 4.1.0. It's right after the Lambda function, but it says it now has a forward pipe syntax available for you. So, and I'm starting to see more people use the base pipe than they are the McGregor pipe, which is kind of sad because I like the McGregor pipe, but I still use it. I don't know. I mean, like, what's the what's the difference? I mean, I guess, um, yeah, you know. You no longer have a dependency on the McGritter package, so um, you reduce you reduce your dependencies in your code because this requires the McGritter package to be available, and yeah, with this know. one, it's just the base because you know base comes with every. I shouldn't say every because that's that's too broad because I'm sure there's some cases where you don't have. The base package, but how do you pronounce that? McGritter? McGritter. McGritter. Yeah. It's like 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 McGreet the painter. MacGyver. <laughs> no, McGreet the Greek. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm the, kidding. The surrealist. And I guess um he, so I don't know. Like, yeah, I, I think he, he did something with pipes. That's 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 why I think we oh. like oh, literally that pipes, like literally like tobacco pipes. I mean. Oh, I didn't know that. So I one of the advantages of the McGritter pipe still is that dot thing, right? You can you can't do that with the base pipe. Oh yeah, there's some I think I think within this there's definitely more like there's definitely different different types of pipes that are available oh, outside of just the forward. I didn't pipe. know about that. Eager pipe. That's cool. Yep. Um I've used the T pipe once or twice, but I haven't really dug into all of these before. But um the McGritter pipe has been around for so long that um, let me see if I can let me see if I can find it. Um, I don't know if you if I, if any of you are familiar with the use this package, but use this yes. package is great for like automating workflows and creating packages. But there is a function called use pipe in here, and I'm kind of going off a tangent here, but there's a function called use pipe and use this that will basically set up the, the ability to use the McGritter pipe in your packages for you. So the McGritter pipe has been around wow. and it's it's been around for a while. So this new base pipe is a game changer. So I've just been using the base pipe because it's shorter to type and I don't I haven't used the special features, but I'm almost always importing tidyverse. So it doesn't really matter as far as that goes. It's just so sad because it's like, it's just like with the pipe, it's been around for so long. Like, I mean, they even have the hotkey in our studio, which was like, you know, shift command M on, on Mac. And so like, that was just ingrained in my brain for so oh. long. Now. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. But now you have a base pipe. So uh, where are we at time wise? Oh, we got, we got about 13 more minutes. So I think we're going to have to need another, we're going to need another. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot here. Yeah, absolutely. And I haven't even touched on exercises because I didn't have chance to get to them. So yeah, no. we'll, we'll see this how far heavy, we can this get. This is a heavy duty chapter. Yeah, it's a lot. When I was reading it, I was like, uh, I don't know if I'm going to get all of it, but hey. Um, so some more about some functions, so different function insights. Uh, so R follows lexical scoping. Um, and I was hoping to get to this one because I came across some really, really good um, uh, like three blog posts from the same person that kind of went through this. Um, I think it's, and again, if if this person's watching, which I don't know if they are, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher your name. I'm going to say Ming Ho Yi. Uh, what they did is they wrote three different blog posts that kind of dive into this idea of lexical and dynamic mm -hmm. scoping and how R is a lexical, um, follows lexical scoping when we try and find values. And I read it and I think it gave me a better understanding of it. So I'll post this in the Slack because I think this does a really, really good job of like describing yeah. it in detail of what it actually means. Um, but really, it's really kind of interesting because I really had to take a step back in my mind and say, okay, what's the definition of scope and what's the definition of lexical so scoping so I can kind of get a grasp of it. And so in these blog posts, this Ming Ho Yi defines scope. Scope refers to the places in a program where a variable is visible and can be referenced. So I thought that was kind of neat. So it's like, how, like, what are the rules around uh, a program's ability or a programming language's ability to find the names of values is basically what scope is. 
And then lexical scoping is the scope of a variable is determined by the lexical or the textual structure of a program. So um, like I said, I'm not a computer science person, so I'm <laughs> leaning on Ming-Ho Yi's definition here, but I thought this kind of helped me kind of grasp it a little bit more. So um, there's there's four different um, four different rules to lexical scoping. And so the first rule was name masking. And the book gives a lot of different examples of how this to kind of exemplify how these rules uh, take place. But I'm only just going to talk about them and like how they're defined. But with name masking, it's the idea that names defined in a function mask names defined outside a function. The second rule is functions versus variables. This is where this basically states that like name masking not only applies to objects, it also applies to functions. Uh, we've already kind of talked a little bit about fresh start today, but it's like this idea that each execution of the function creates a new environment. And so we need to understand that functions are not smart enough to know what happened in the past. And then this idea of dynamic lookup. Uh, I struggled with dynamic lookup a little bit, especially when it got to this idea of debugging, which we'll get here to in a second. But it's basically that R looks for values when the function is run, not when the function is created. And so I'm going to pose this one because I thought this, this did a really good job of highlighting some of those rules uh, in those blog posts that I'll share a little bit later. But I'm just going to ask the group here, what do you think gets returned from this function G? What do you think gets returned? Hold on. And I can bump it up too. I'm sorry if it's been a little too small for people to see it. I'm going to say one. Okay, got one. What do you think, Ron? I have to check myself to make sure. So why do you say it's one there, Ryan? Well, isn't it like, doesn't the function always return the last thing that it does? And so, okay, so the F function takes one as its argument, right? Oh, okay, but hold on. All right. Yeah, it's, I agree it's one, I think, too, for the same reason you're saying. Hold on, but then, okay, so then, okay, so then the F function is being called within G, and so in the G function, X is two. Nope, you're dynamic scoping. <laughs> oh, that's not, that doesn't count then. I think you're on the right track, though, like because you're saying it's calling the f function, and here's f, or here's the f function as it's defined, and you have x. So, thinking about the lexical scoping rules, especially name masking, where is x defined in relation to this one? Well, it's outside in the, in the global environment, right? X1, right? So it should return one, which I just double checked myself to make sure it does return one. And um, again, I think that's mainly due to this idea of name masking and basically a fresh start because you do have X2 that's defined here, but, um, you know, it won't, it, you know, creates its own environment calling F. So it creates a new F environment and then you have X and then you have one. So I thought this like really simple. Well, wait, no, it's not creating a new F environment. Then it's, the F environment is created when F is defined. Yeah. Okay. When F is defined, there's an object created called F, and it has the environment associated with that environment is uh, has this variable X defined in it, which is, I guess its environment is just the global environment at that point, right? So, mm -hmm. so wait, now if you redefine X at the global level, would it affect it? Oh, that's a good question. It has its own copy of X at this point. I've forgotten that, how that works. Is it, is it have a, it has a separate environment or does it just have a pointer to a global environment? That's a good question. Well, let's take a look here. So, so we have this one. We define the X, we define the G, define the G again, we get one. Now type down there, X goes to not, yeah, down there just type X goes to 47 or something. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. Seven. Not so, call G, I guess. Okay, so it does have a pointer to the global environment. So wait, hold yeah. on. Sorry. What the, so the answer is 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 one. Then is that yeah. right? By the way, I'm right only because blind squirrels are probably <laughs> um, also right sometimes, as as as, as someone once said. 
<laughs> so I, I, I mean, I, you know, my, my, my reasoning was, is, um, right now I see, right. So the X in, in F refers to the global X, right? I mean, this will become, I think some of this will become more clear when we learn more about our environment. I'm hoping this will become more clear when we learn more about how environments work, but. Because, because the F looks to the global environment to find its X, right? right. Okay. Yep. And so, but, but then redefining X within the, the function environment of G su supersedes going upstairs or going to the global environment to find X. I think that's where it was. Yes. But you, I know, but there is a way to do that. Uh, you can use a double, what is it yep. called? Double assignment or global um, assignment? Super anyway, assignment. Super assignment. Now you can really wreak havoc, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do super assignment here, which is the double arrow, which would push this two into the global environment once you run G. Yeah. <laughs> I, super assignment, people say to kind of avoid because of that issue of like pushing it outside of the function environment, but. I thought this was like a really simple example that really did a good it's job. It's a very like, good example. Yeah. Yeah. Really highlights uh, some issues right away. Yeah. So it, I, and it's really simple too. It's not even like you can wrap your mind around it really quickly. Um, yeah. So I, I really like this. This, this again, it came from this. Um, like I said, there's three, there's three blog posts that really do a good job that. and they dive, it dives really deep into it beyond like my knowledge set of like how this all works, but when I came it's across like, this example, I was like, really good. Um, there's something else I was going to say about this too. Oh, uh, what tipped me off too is because, um, and again, I'm not using our studio in this case right here, but <clears throat> my linter that I have set up in my environment, it already flagged it as there's a problem with X2. It's basically telling me, hey, X isn't assigned and may not be used in this chunk here. So that kind of tipped oh, me off. Oh, that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of got a head start with my linter when it was just like, hey, you might not be referencing X. So I'm just like, oh. Hmm. So I've used that lintar thing. That's a that's a nice package. I need to use that. Uh well, this isn't lintar. This is like this is something different, but I think lintar will pick this up basically where it's like you're not because you're using X and it's not being used anywhere. But um, but I thought that was kind of interesting when I saw that. I was like, it picked it up because you're technically not using that that two value. So um, where are we at time-wise? We've got about four more minutes. Uh, I guess this will probably be the last thing that we talk about. We can save the rest for next time. But yeah, this idea of debugging, are, in the notes it was called debugging, but I don't think it was debugging. But it took this example here. And basically what it tried to do is it tried to use this like find globals, um, this find globals function. I really didn't understand this completely and i think ron you might be right because environments might clear this up a little bit but i had to go back to a couple of the old cohorts videos to see what they said about it and like the way i understand it is all this find global is doing is it's just finding the dependency for this function that it's calling and so therefore if you give it an empty environment it's going to tell you that it can't find plus or x or i can't find this plus because it's a new environment but i i got confused about it so yeah it's just telling you all the like sometimes they call them free variables right since in that g112 g12 sorry uh function it's just defined as a function that returns x plus one x is free in there it's not bound you didn't define x in there so it's a global it has to refer to the global variable or whatever the outside outer environment is so find globals could have been called find free or something like that. But no, it's not quite true because plus is bound. But anyway, it's free in that function. Even plus is free in that function. It's not defined in that function. So it's some you know variable that has to, has to be defined somewhere else. So it's a good reason why I have to call this debugging. It's a good way to check. If you didn't intend for that to be a, you know, in a big long function, you do find globals like, wait, why is uh, um, mm. my favorite data glo uh, global? It's, I def thought I defined it in this function or it should be an argument or something, but um I don't want this function to depend on some global variable assignments. Oh, that makes sense. And that's what, and that's what, that's what like the other cohorts were saying is it's like this idea of like trying to identify dependencies, right? Yeah. Being able to use this function as a debugging tool to say like, oh, like if you expect this value to be defined somewhere, whether that be in your function or if it's reaching out to the global environment, then you can kind of use this as a debugging right. tool. Right. If you did intend to be global, then that's fine. You'll be able to verify. But if you've got some other surprises in there, you'd be like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs>
No wonder yes. my function doesn't work because when I, I mistyped it, you know, I mistyped the definition of this thing and then I started using it. And I, I do that all the time, right? And I'm like, wait, why doesn't this stupid thing work? Oh, because here I called it, you know, uh, red underscore two. And here I'm just calling it red two or something. And I wonder it doesn't work, right? That makes sense. Usually when my functions fail, it's like, oh, shoot, something's wrong. And I don't <laughs> just try and like dig in the function. I could probably. I didn't know about this fine global thing. I'll try it from now on. Yeah, I just, I keep just like looking around. Oh, where did I screw up? Oh, there it is. <laughs> I think there's some also some other ones too, like find find class, find interval. Oh, I think there's even like a yeah, f- find pan. Yeah, so there's a bunch of other ones that are available. Um, but I thought it was kind of neat. I kind I think that kind of clarifies it a little well, bit. So, all right. Well, we're right at five o'clock, and I don't think I want to go. Yeah, I think it's five o'clock. So, so we're gonna next week is holiday, and then the week after we should finish this chapter. Then I think it's. Right I think right. so. so. I think we get through. Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Sorry. So you're gonna just push things on the on the spreadsheet. I think that would be best. I mean, yeah. if it if something doesn't work out, if something doesn't work out for people, like let me know, and then we'll you know obviously switch it around. But since it's we're taking it, since we're taking a week off, I think we'll be able to figure it out. Yeah, this book, this chapter is definitely going to take at least two, if not just a little bit of like the third session. So, but. This is important because we need to know this because this stuff is going to come up again because R is a functional programming language. So yeah, have to know how functions work. <laughs> a lazy functional programming language, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> One of the few. There's only a few out right. there. Cool. Well, I'm going to end up, I'm going to end there. So unless yeah. you guys want to chat about something else or talk about some of this other stuff. Um, we'll we'll yeah. see. We'll talk on the um the second. It sounds like we'll finish this up. It sounds like we yeah. still have quite a lot to do. I mean, I'll have some stuff prepared for environments, but I I think um yeah, we got a lot. <laughs> it might be a whole other se- uh, session. Oh yeah, if you get through some of the environments, you might be able to help maybe shed some light on some. Of well, stuff. but I'm thinking more sequentially. But well, yeah, I'll I'll, yeah. I'll try to have something ready for the second. But it sounds like you might need the whole time just to cover that. I mean, it's uh, by you know, it's not it's necessary I mean, there's a lot there and it is necessary i agree yeah 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 i yeah absolutely so like i said like the cohort six did three sessions for it so yeah. it's, a, it's a lot of stuff yeah. well have a happy holiday I'll yeah go. you guys have a happy holiday too yeah See have a happy holiday second. safe travels if you're traveling um, i'm not traveling then... thankfully but yeah, yeah seriously. <laughs> all right well we'll see you guys See have you a guys yeah. day. see ya see ya yeah.